Uh, welcome to the presentation. My name is Igor Impossible Lasne. Uh, I work at Canonical. I'm a developer advocate at the Snapcraft, on the Snapcraft team. And today I want to talk to you about some interesting things that can help your life either as a developer or an end user. So, okay. I will stop sharing my screen and I will control the slides using the built-in feature. So I just have to figure out how to move slides. Uh, okay, excellent. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, so back to the presentation. Thank you, Alison, for that. Uh, back to the presentation. So I want to talk to you about some interesting things that will help you uh, use Snaps either as a developer or as an end user. You may know some of these things, so apologies in advance if uh, things look familiar. The other thing to take into account is if I move through some of the topics quickly and you have questions, please ask them. Also, all of the stuff that I'm going to review is documented on our uh, documentation. And I have written blog posts about most of these topics in detail with examples. That said, a little more uh, about myself. As I said, I work as a developer advocate. I've been using Linux for roughly two decades now. Uh, doing it for fun, for passion, and work. I happen to write books. That is my second big passion. And the third one, as you can probably guess, looking at the uh, image, is I like to drive fast cars on racetracks around the world. The COVID situation has made that a bit more complicated, but I'm trying my best. That said, let's go with the first trick. So when you develop snaps, uh, you have two options to use different backends uh, for development. Basically, snaps will be built inside contained environments so that you don't uh, pollute or change your underlying system on which you build. You have two options. You can use virtual machines with Multipass as the driving engine, or you can use lightweight containers with LXD as the driving engine. If you have a virtualized environment yourself, in which you developed, you may find it a little bit more difficult to use multipass due to a uh, potential nesting. To work around this, you can use LXD with a special switch, which allows you then to build snaps inside virtual machines. So we have an inception situation, basically a virtual machine container inside a virtual machine. And of course, you can try to see how deep you can go before the system explodes. Remote build. This has been brought up yesterday during uh, our uh, office hour. And the question was, is it possible to cross compile uh, snaps? The answer is no, but. And the but is uh, the, op the option to actually use remote build functionality. You can send your project to launch, uh, Launchpad and Launchpad will build for six different architectures, which you don't may not have necessarily locally. You basically need just your uh, Launchpad token to authenticate, and after that, your project will be built. This is quite useful if you want to target, say, ARM, or you want to target uh, something like S390, IBM S390, or other things that you may not necessarily have in your uh, uh, architecture portfolio. Of course, you still need to test your snaps. You have to make sure that the libraries you have selected and that your application logic can function on these other architectures, but this can greatly simplify your work. The one caveat is that uh, your project will be public in the sense that it will be available and visible on Launchpad. So if you have a closed source application, you probably shouldn't use this. OK, shell after. If you're developing a snap and you want to see how it behaves after it's been built, you can use uh, shell after to step into, uh, into the snap build environment world and see what happens there. This way, you will have access to snap environment variables. You will have access to the build structure and be able to inspect different bits and pieces. This can be quite useful if you're trying to troubleshoot an error that doesn't seem obvious from outside of the build environment. So you're building, something goes wrong. You're not quite sure why, why things are misbehaving. Step into the build world and troubleshoot yourself. Then you can, of course, step out and resume your normal development Tip number four is, again, something that should help you build your snaps much faster and test them more efficiently. So you can actually test a snap without installing it. Uh, for example, 
just download a snap from uh, from the store, then unsquash the archive. Snap is basically a squashfs file system archive. Step into it and then run snap dry. This will emulate the normal installation of a snap and it will be presented to you as an installed application, which you can then try and, and play with. So at this point, you could potentially uh, add things into the SquashFS file system and then snap try again, basically remount the, uh, the archive, use it, see what gives. And this can help you, for instance, uh, nail down any missing libraries, figure out if you have any permissions or broken symlinks, perhaps things that could potentially happen if you have uh, maybe some disorder in your sources. Similarly, you can use Snapcraft back if you have your sources and if you have your built artifacts in a work folder, in a work directory. You haven't yet built the Snap itself. You can use Snapcraft back, which will assemble all these different components into a Snap, and then you can try it and play with it. Both these things should help you work faster as in you don't have to wait for the build environment to be built. You don't have to uh, uh, wait for long compilation times if you know uh, that the problem is in just small bits and pieces just before the runtime of the application or something similar to that. One more thing that should be useful to developers is snappy debug. Basically, if your snap doesn't run well, and this can happen due to permission errors, as snaps are self-contained and confined applications, and they communicate with the underlying system through a mechanism of interfaces. So if you haven't specified the necessary interfaces, or they are not connected, or perhaps there are other permission issues due to the nature of this con uh, confinement, you can then install a special troubleshooting snap called Snappy Debug, run it in a separate command, uh, command line window, and as you run your snap, and test it normally in a, in a different terminal, in a different shell, you will see uh, a log, an output in, in, uh, in the snappy debug log. It will give you app armor denial errors and suggestions on how you can work around potential problems. This can help you understand why, even though the build may be successful, your snap doesn't run well, quite as well as you should, as it should. Again, for developers and people interested in understanding how and why things work, there is Snap S-Trace. Basically, S-Trace is a uh, utility that lets you trace system calls and understand why and how problems may occur during uh, application startups or runtimes. You could have a, a crash and you need to understand why something went wrong. So, Snap, so you can run Snaps with an S-Trace flag and then use all the normal optional arguments that S3 supports to print out uh, the log of, of that execution. For instance, you may only want to trace um, open system calls, or you may actually want to have longer printouts, so the default 64 character string may not be sufficient for you. Uh, you can also do just the summary of the run and understand what, what's happening. This is quite useful because it allows you to step into the SNAP world despite the fact that there is strong security confinement around it. And warming up, on the same note, we also have GDB support with SNAPs. You can actually run a GDB server, uh, which will then open a port, a high port, and connect to it using either a different terminal window or even uh, an ID or any remote uh, debugging troubleshooting tool that supports GDB. And so in a separate shell, you run GDB, and then you can do the, the usual things that you would do when you're troubleshooting an application. You can uh, set breakpoints, you can set conditions, you can step into the execution, um, you can disassemble uh, the code. So everything that you would normally do to understand if your application is not working, you can also do with snaps. Review tools. So let's assume that uh, you have built your snap, uh, you've tried all the other different tricks that we've just outlined, and you believe that your snap is ready to be uploaded to the store. Normally what happens is your snap will be reviewed, uh, it will be automatically scanned, and it may not be allowed into the store just yet for publication if the security scan detects potential problems with your, uh, with your application. 
For instance, you may have um, broken security permissions, or your application tries to do something that it, should, it shouldn't. You will get these errors, and then your uh, upload will be blocked. Basically, your publication will be blocked until uh, there is a manual review by the security team. To minimize this time disruption, you can run review tools, uh, a, a lightweight version of what happens when you upload your SNAP to the store locally. Install it, run it, and examine your SNAP. It will give you indications, warnings, or hard errors as to what you may have done wrong, security-wise, so you can go back, fix it, get a green light from review tools, and only then upload the SNAP. Should save you time. <coughs> Apologies. Should save you time, especially if you're in a hurry uh, and you want to upload uh, your SNAP and publish it quickly. Default track. Uh, most people will probably just have one track, one main, let's call it, one main path to how they publish their SNAP. And some people may actually have multiple tracks. And you may have a legacy track, for instance. You may have the latest track. Uh, sorry, the latest track is the default one. You may have a, a numbered version uh, tracks for your application. But then you may want your users not necessarily to use the, the last or, or, or the legacy track. You can set, actually, which track is the default one. So when people install without our additional arguments, they will get the desired version. This can actually also help you perhaps test how your different uh, versions behave or maybe stagger the installation of different uh, versions of, 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 the, of your application. It's entirely up to you. But the option is there and you can use it. Snap connections. So I, earlier, I mentioned security confinement and I mentioned interfaces. So to, to give it a, a more visual analogy, uh, snaps are fully self-contained, so they sit in a, in, in, a, in a benevolent prison and they can't communicate with the outside world. That's a security uh, feature by design. But then snaps that don't communicate with system resources aren't that useful. Therefore, there's the mechanism of interfaces. You can tell snaps to be able to connect to the home directory, to network, to the audio and video, uh, perhaps Bluetooth, um, USB. There are tons and tons of interfaces. Some of these will be auto-connected, which means when the SNAP is installed, they'll be available to the end user. Others will not. And if you want to make sure that your application works and behaves uh, as, as you expect, you can check for an installed SNAP which uh, interfaces it has connected. Basically, which plugs and which slots those plugs connect into. And if a certain interface isn't auto-connected, then your application may assume behavior that is not available and may not, not run well. Similarly, as an end user, you may want to test the SNAP, but you're not quite sure what it does. So you could say, okay, I will disconnect the SNAP from network, for instance. I want to use an uh, office uh, suit just in, a, in an offline mode. Or maybe I want to use a browser, but I don't want to give it access to audio or my webcam. So you can tweak your privacy uh, opportunistically as you need to. You can perhaps uh, disconnect a browser during the session, uh, a specific interface for a browser during the session, then you can connect it later on and vice versa. Aliases. So this is something that can be useful if your application uh, has, okay, if your SNAP has multiple applications contained inside it, or you want to make life easier either for yourself or for your end users. Normally, snaps have one application inside. So let's say, for instance, uh, oh, okay, I'll just use a, a silly example. Let's say KCalc, a calculator, it has one application inside it. It's just the calculator itself. But if you look at something more complicated, let's say LibreOffice or Calligra, you have multiple applications. You have the spreadsheet application, you have the word processor application, you have the, the, uh, the, the presentation one. So there can be three, four, five, ten different applications contained inside a SNAP. So when you run that SNAP, you, act, you then need to invoke the specific application explicitly. You have to give a full name and then the application name. And in some cases, this could be a bit cumbersome. Then, if you want to make it simpler for your users, you can request from the store team to create aliases for you, 
or as an end user, you can create them locally on your system. And then, for instance, instead of executing, let's say, LibreOffice.Writer to run Writer, you could just have Writer as your uh, alias or, or something completely different, whatever you feel like. This can simplify usage and make the overall experience more streamlined. Parallel installs. I think this is probably one of the nicest end user features uh, that exist. And one of the great advantages of Snaps compared to the traditional uh, Linux packaging. You can have multiple versions of the same Snap installed on your system. And in some cases, you may even be able to run multiple versions of the same application in parallel. The way this is done is you may potentially need to uh, enable an experimental feature on your system if it's not enabled or supported. And then you can install a snap by giving it the name it has in the store and then underscore as a qualifier that defines the versioning and then give it a, a whatever string you like as a version name. So for instance, we have a screenshot here of VLC. You can install VLC first VLC second, VLC fifth, whatever you like. And then these multiple snaps will be presented on your system in parallel. And then you can run the first instance and the second and the third and the fourth. And you can perhaps compare how they behave. I here have a screenshot where you have the, the current VLC three family and then the new VLC four sitting side by side. And you can see, oh, I like the new UI, I don't like it, I want to compare functionality, is the audio quality the same, and so forth. Please know that in some cases, your application itself may not like having multiple instances of itself loaded into memory. Uh, an application may bind to a port, uh, may use sockets, uh, may expect um, may expect to use a, a data profile from your hard disk, and if multiple instances try to access the same resource at the same time, you could have a contention or a potential conflict. So in some cases, this may not work from the pure application functionality aspect, but in others, it may work really well. And even if you can't really run things at the same time, you can have them definitely installed in parallel and then test them in a different way. This doesn't don't have to be just major version differences. This could be different uh, stability uh, levels that are available in the store. You can have a uh, stable version and an edge version side by side. Compare them, see how they behave. Is there any breakage in functionality? Uh, is everything working the way you expected? You want to migrate to a new version of a tool? Are your databases going to be affected? Is your usage pattern going to be affected? It's quite useful. Okay. Now, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. So, today, people have pretty big hard disks normally, and space isn't an issue. But sometimes, especially for laptop users, uh, storage can still be a bit of a problem. If you have uh, SSD or NVMe uh, storage, they usually come at a higher price. So you won't necessarily have two or four or eight terabyte SSD. You'll probably have something smaller. And in that case, you may want to kind of make sure that your disk usage is reasonable. By default, when you install snaps, uh, three revisions will be kept. So you install a revision one, two, and three. Uh, the pointer will rotate to the latest version and you will be using it, but the others will still exist on your disk and take space. You can actually tell uh, SnapD, the service that manages this, how many versions you want to retain. The minimum is actually two, but you can go up as much as you like. And this could be useful if you have, I don't know, if, if you need to have these multiple versions for legacy purposes, for, for testing purposes, to, to keep track, nostalgia's sake, whatever you like. This, this way you can trim down overall usage of how much snaps take, uh, at the very least, if you want to uh, trim it down by about a uh, third. I will stop briefly to answer a question um, where about the previous point, which I brought up. I'll go back. It's do parallel installations isolate instance app configurations? If I understand correctly, this question is um, 
does each snap run data isolated from the others? And the answer is maybe. So, of course, some data will be private, but there will be some shared data. Let's, let's think of something like a browser profile. Your browser profile is one, and it sits on the disk, right? So if you load your browser profile, and you want to load it into two different instances of, a, of an application, that may work or may not work. Uh, the problem is mostly with writing, right? If you do two separate browsing sessions, and then you need to write the session to the disk, which one takes precedence? A separate one would be uh, your application may have, may listen on, on a, a local port, let's say 9,500. Both versions cannot bind to the same port at the same time. You might have to edit configuration and say, okay, this version goes to port 9,500, the other one will go 501. Those kind of things. So it is a combination of what snaps can do, but also what the application can do. Uh, worst case, you will have these parallel instances, but you may need to run them sequentially. However, you still have the option to do that. Uh, running parallel instances in parallel uh, applications uh, on your disk, that may or may not work always. That's uh, a bit of a hit and miss. So, back to the snap provisions. Like I said, we can, uh, by this way, this way, you can trim down the data usage by about a third or, of course, increase it if you have a need for that. On the maintenance side, there's also uh, an important element of uh, date of snap updates. So snap a refresh occasionally. By default, uh, SnapD will contact the store four times a day and ask for any updates to your installed snaps. If those updates exist, your snaps will be updated. In some cases, this may not be convenient. Uh, you may be presenting, like I'm doing now. You don't necessarily want to have an update happening in the background for, uh, it could be disk usage, it could be network usage, or you just don't want an application to update while you're working with it. Uh, you may also have a specific uh, environment requirement. Say, uh, at your workplace, you don't install uh, applications on every system in, at the same time. You have a staggered deployment, you install on a four or five test machines first, then you have a kind of a semi-staging area, and then finally you have uh, a production setup. So you can uh, modify when the SnapD service runs its updates. There are multiple options. Uh, first of all, you can set almost like a cron, a specific timetable. You can say that updates only happen on Friday at two o'clock. You could also say that um, snaps only update every second Tuesday. Or you can go with a very specific date format, which you can set and then convert to tell uh, SnapD, OK, I'd like my snaps to update on the 27th of uh, May at 9.24 in the morning. This way, you can then combine updates, which bring security and functionality changes, with testing, uh, reliability practices, or other or other things that you may have in your business organization or even at home. By, by def uh, in general, you can defer SNAP updates up to 60 days at the moment. Uh, this may change in the future, as in you may get additional further controls and, and flexibility in how this is done. And there is a question here where it says, will it be possible to configure refreshing from the store GUI or the updates app or the repositories to make it more friendly for newbies? The answer is perhaps. So one thing to take into account is that people don't necessarily just use Ubuntu. They may be on a Fedora system or Arch, Manjaro or OpenSUSE, and their front end will be different. So in some cases, the implementation will uh, rely on the specific distro implementation, whether it allows and supports uh, snaps in the backend. If that exists, it might be implementable. Uh, whether this should be available to uh, a front end, like say a GNOME software on your Ubuntu system, maybe uh, it's a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, if you are a newbie, you might not necessarily want to tinker with updates 
because you don't necessarily understand the full implications of such changes. If you are a more tech-savvy user, then you will have 15 workarounds to every problem and five solutions as well, and then you will feel comfortable doing it. It is very difficult to balance these kind of things because normally what you end up is either an oversimplified solution that makes techies super angry, or you end up with super techy solutions that uh, newbies cannot use. Technology, in a way, if you look at the two sides of the spectrum, you either have something that's very, very simplified, like you have on smartphones today, in a way, or you have Linux, where it's basically do it yourself. And then what's the best solution? For, for mid-range users, it's hard to say. Um, please email me. You'll see my email at the end of this presentation. I'll bring it up with the SnapD team. And we consider all proposals, ideas, and suggestions. Doesn't mean we implement all of them, but we'll definitely look at it. And if you have a, a real need, and there's a way for us to implement it in a reasonable way, I don't think there should be a big problem with it. OK, so snap refresh control, you can do basically whatever you like, uh, well, within reason. And I think this can be especially useful if you have a critical application in, uh, that, that uses consume as a snap. So you can then say, all right, I have four systems. The first system will get its updates daily. The second system will do it only weekly. The third one will have a monthly update with rigorous QA. And the fourth one, a production system, only if the first three checks pass, we deploy. And then that one will have, say, a deferral of 60 days. And every time you successfully update your snap, you will then push uh, the, the date for next update by another 60 days. That's just an example. Or you somehow combine it with your configuration management tools, Puppet, Chef, or so, and so forth. Number 15, this will be the last trick of the day, is snap snapshots. Uh, I added a lightweight joke here for you to practice at home after the, um, the session. Basically, you can snapshot your snaps, and snaps, uh, snaps get snapshotted automatically when they get removed. Have a snap on your system, and you don't want it anymore, you delete it. Because... And then two days later, you say, oh, I didn't back up my data that was contained in that snap. It will be gone, right? To avoid that painful situation where things are forever deleted and any trace of it is lost from your disk, SnapD will keep a snapshot of a deleted snap for 30 days. You can, again, manually, yes. The question number three is, can we force snapshot? Yes, you can. You can just run snap, snap save, name of a snap, and you will have a snapshot on your disk. Of course, this takes space. Snapshot is basically just an archive. You can copy it then and extract it to a different system if you like. If you want to have your own data retention or reinstallation policy, you could technically have a script that snapshots your snaps. You can then SCP or, or rsync the, that data to a second system, for instance, extract the data from the snapshotted archives into the snap uh, writable directories, and you will have the data available for use. In some cases, if your application has system or machine-specific information saved, then you could potentially encounter weird things when you restore these snapshots on a different system. Let's say that your application relies on a machine UUID, or a hardware model for some reason, a string of a hardware model, something, I, I, whatever, right? If you then restore on a system that doesn't have those specifications, your application may go, oh, wait, I, I'm using data that doesn't really belong to me. But in general, you can uh, create snapshots whenever you like. You can check them. You can delete them. You can also delete snapshots that are created for your deleted snaps. If you feel like, okay, I don't want this, I really want my disk space back, you can just uh, purge any snapshot with the full knowledge that your data will be gone, of course, in, inside those sna in snapshots. And I think this brings me to one, questions, and my contact details. So if you want to ask any questions around snaps, or even any other things, feel free to reach out. If I don't have the answer, I'll direct you to the right person in Canonical. We have about 10 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, and feel free to 
free, free, feel free to ask any questions that haven't been raised so far. Okay. We have, uh, yes, yes, please. Okay. So we have two questions. Uh, I'll answer number five first because it was uh, typed down first. Is what will happen if different users install the same snap? Will different snaps be installed? I presume uh, the question is it's the same system, a multi user system, which has two, three, four users running on it and they will have admin privileges to install applications. Am I correct in this assumption? So snaps are installed uh, globally. So you can't really, ins well, you can parallel install multiple versions, but if you install the snap, it's, it's there. So you won't necessarily have a problem where you have multiple names, but you don't have multiple namespaces, there's one namespace. Uh, so that shouldn't be a big issue. Uh, however, if you have multiple admins, they could potentially uh, install multiple parallel versions of a snap. They could tweak configurations, or they could do things with system management that could conflict what the other user has in mind. Uh, when it comes to admin, I think it's like in the movie Highlander. There can there should be only one. So hopefully you you have seen the movie and remember it. So otherwise, my joke is uh, wasted here. And number four, does Debian also have such system feature? Can you please clarify what you mean by uh, such system feature? I'm not 100% sure which one it is. We have 15 things that I've mentioned. So is this related to snapshots? OK. Um, does uh, Debian have snapshotting functionality on its own? To the best of my knowledge, no. Most Linux distributions don't have that because the file system isn't um, isn't layered. The file, everything is basically shared. Some operating systems do have this. For instance, OpenSUSE, if you if you use ButterFS, has a tool called Snapper, which allows you to create uh, ButterFS snapshots. And then you uh, you have the ability to delta your system changes. And if you don't like something, you can then uh, restore a previous version, I think even through the boot menu. Uh, if there are any open source users who have used ButterFS and Snapper, you can maybe help out and add additional information here. Most distros and most systems, Linux systems don't have snapshot features. You can implement your own uh, mechanism with something like, uh, uh, time shift, or you can use system imaging, or you can just use rsync and create your own archives. So whoever asked number four, um, I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Number six, can you use the home interface to give each snap its own home directory mapping to an arbitrary location in the file system? Snaps don't necessarily have access to arbitrary locations because of the security confinement. There is a uh, confinement mode called classic, which gives you system level permissions. That one has arbitrary access to uh, the system and it's necessary in some cases, like for instance, IDEs, which need to access data in random places or even trigger uh, arbitrary binaries. Strictly confined snaps are not designed to wander around the system and touch things that they don't belong to them. So snaps, yes, they can have their own uh, data uh, repositories or they, they, their own mini homes, but then they need to be implemented in the application logic. You could potentially say to your, uh, tell, your snap could then write its configuration in a, into a specific subdirectory or use a specific hidden file 
that can also be uh, agreed upon from a security perspective with a store team. And But there is also an element of replication logic. It cannot be just a blind snap side change. The, the actual content of the snap also needs to be location aware in that sense. Otherwise, if you just use something like documents or pictures, it will assume it's the documents and pictures that are available through your home directory. Any other questions? What co okay, question number seven. What containerization tools are used in Snap? Example, bubble wrap in uh, Flatpak. So the security confinement is done through multiple tools. There's up armor rules, there's seccomp, and C groups. Those three give you pretty much the isolation uh, from the underlying system. You can actually uh, inspect this uh, if you have a Snap um, system with SnapD go under var snap and start exploring and you will see some rather interesting things or if you are code savvy and you really want to know the internal uh, mechanisms of the snapd service it's available on github sources there you can poke around and see what gives even compile your own version if you like questions for us We can also do a live practice of that funny sentence that I wrote in uh, slide number 15 is how many snaps could a snap snapshot if snap could snapshot snaps and the winner gets, I don't, I don't know, I'll leave it to the organizers of the conference to do it. So yes, question number eight. What's the status of SNAP support across distros? Officially, SNAPD can be installed and used on 40 plus distributions, including the Debian family, Ubuntu family, Fedora, uh, Red Hat CentOS, Arch, Manjaro, and a few others. So if you are a user of one of the supported distributions, SNAPD should run well, your SNAP should run well or just as well as they run on an ubuntu system if they don't then we may have a problem with our tooling and if we would definitely like to know about it so we can help improve and make your user experience just as good as as it is on say on ubuntu um, i mentioned this briefly in the office hours for instance uh, in our engineering teams and uh, we use we use different systems we have a couple of people with arch I myself use Kubuntu, so I have KDE. We have people who are on the latest version, people who use uh, latest LTS, people who use the latest um, interim release, people who are on the previous LTS. We do try to vary a little bit so that we don't just uh, test one thing and say, okay, if it works on Ubuntu, it's perfect. We also try to make sure that other distributions are first-class citizens and that everyone has the same consistent experience. That's not the case. We would uh, actually urge you to tell us so we can make it better. Number nine isn't so much a question. It's more of a comment. Nobody uses Fedora on the team. <laughs> OK, uh, it's, it's a nice joke. I'll allow it. I hope this is not Alesh being funny again, because he uh, ran out of his uh, jokes quota yesterday. Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions?
Here's a super interesting question. Number 10, other distributions basis for snaps possible. I presume you are talking about uh, okay, so for people who don't understand what this question is about, uh, because snaps run in an isolated manner, they need to see some 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 sort of a root file system. So basically, the uh, the file system that is presented is something called base, and it is uh, equivalent to the Ubuntu LTS release based on the versioning. So if you have something like Core 18, then your underlying system, your base will be Ubuntu 18.04. If it's core 20, it will be 20.04 and, and so forth. But the question is then, can we perhaps have something like a Fedora core or maybe CentOS core or some, something like that? Technically, yes. Has that been implemented? Not to the best of my knowledge, but if that can drive snap adoption or make the user experiences even better, I think this is worth exploring, maybe even working together so whoever asked this question please reach out maybe we can explore this and make this a possibility sweet free desktop SDK. sounds good sounds interesting can you please reach out thank you very much this is i, I really like this and I'll, i want to see how we can explore and make this maybe into a real possibility number 11 what's your favorite experimental feature uh, i have to say parallels in parallel installs hands down it is so good because typically if you want to have something that's parallel like on Linux, you download an archive from, from a vendor. If they offer their uh, Linux application as, as an archive, you uh, untar, unzip the thing, and then you just run it locally. And this way you basically have a normal application. It's available to the system menu. You can have 400 instances of it if you like, and, and, and you can do crazy things. So I recommend you test it and probably a system with multiple versions of applications just to see what gives 12. do you know if there is some chance of fedora silver blue supporting snaps i think um that question should be partially answered by the fedora team i don't know if we have anyone here i don't know uh, who works on on fedora and if they are here i uh, welcome them to answer this or even if you want, you can reach out by email and we'll see and, and see how we can explore this potential. We have three minutes. Uh, so if there are any more questions, please let's try to give, uh, let, let's see if I can answer that in the next three minutes. No more jokes from Alesh. Number 13, how can we make sure developers update dependencies for security? Okay. Uh, first, on the Snap Store side, if you're a publisher and you have an account in the Snap Store, you will get email notifications that your snaps have up out of date security packages. At that point, it is your due diligence as the publisher and the developer of, of that snap to uh, update it. However, there is always an element of human goodwill and application supportability on behalf of the developers. So it's a two-way thing. One, we try to expose and make potential security issues visible to the publishers and developers and help them update their applications uh, in, a, in a smooth manner. But then there also has to be goodwill and desire from the publishers and maintainers and, and developers to keep their applications up to date. So that will never be a complete solution without cooperation on both sides. Okay, let's see what else is here. Um, so there's one more comment on question number 12, whereby snaps, uh, classic snaps use slash snap, which is forbidden by RPM OS3. Regular confined snaps work fine. I understand classic confinement is never really a uh, one for all solution, but since this is a very interesting topic, please reach out because uh, there might be something in the works that we could think of and figure out how to fix it. And I think I'm out of time and I need to hand over to the next presenter. 
So please reach out to my email for any other questions. Uh, I enjoyed the session today. I would have loved to hear you because I enjoy human interaction. Uh, if you have uh, any other comments or jokes, please reach out. Uh, if you like this session, give a thumbs up as well. That works. Hope to see you around. And if uh, if you wanna you need any help with Snap Development, just knock on the door and we'll see what we, we can do together. Thank you very much for your time.